All right, here we go. Today is Sunday, March 1st, 2020, and this is episode 247 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Good evening, Jerry. How are you, sir? I am good. I'm um, kind of tired of traveling, but... uh, I was going to say... Tired from traveling, I should say. You probably sound different to a lot of folks on the show and that's because you're in a very equity secure undisclosed location otherwise known as a hotel room yes <laughs> with bad acoustics well, and a and a condenser microphone so yes in, in all seriousness what some of the voiceover artists do is they will actually go into a closet and they'll build a little fo- kind of foam and cloth box that they yeah. will surround their microphone with and put it over their head. And, uh, I mean, I'm just saying, if you wanted to be a professional. I, I'm <laughs> not that – I guess what you're saying is I'm not that committed to my craft here. What I'm saying is that first you need to put something over your head. Oh, and, okay. And, and, Preferably plastic. And, and, you know, it's not a toy. Okay, fair enough. Now, there there are – I have seen on Amazon um, – they have the, like the little three-sided uh, uh, deal with the, the sound insulating foam, but that seems like it'd be a big pain in the ass to uh, to travel with. So yeah, yeah, probably true. But anyway, okay. so that's yeah. why Jerry's at Wade today. So please forgive us. <laughs> so the first story tonight comes from Security Week, and the title here is "State-Sponsored Cyber Spies Use Sophisticated Server Firewall Bypass Technique." Woohoo! Wow. So um. So here's the deal. Sophos uh, discovered some malware running on servers of a particular organization running in AWS. Those servers were behind a firewall that only allowed port 80 and port 443 through. And yet uh, there was kind of bi-directional command and control stuff happening. And what they what they discovered was a, uh, a Trojan uh, on... Uh, apparently a bunch of different servers, both Linux and Windows. Uh, the, the the way this Trojan got there is the subject of some uh, speculation. Uh, but basically it's, it's, it's the, the, the novelty here is that the Trojan itself uh, basically intercepts, there's a shim that listens or in, intercepts traffic coming in on 80 and 443 and routes format, especially formatted uh, traffic to the Trojan. And then when the Trojan needs to respond, it gets sent back out uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, HTTP or HTTPS port to the command and control server. So, so that shim must be sitting on the web server itself because it's got to be able to decrypt the traffic. So it's got to it be is. like after the web server decrypts the HTTPS traffic. And Correct. Takes a look exactly. at it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. So you know the, the the challenge here is that if you're you know if you're if you're looking at just kind of what ports are open and you're taking solace in well you know you've got a firewall in place that's not you know it's not a uh, a foolproof solution. Now having said that, this is you know apparently been attributed to some super sophisticated nation state, uh, but I I think that that. You know, the thing that I've learned over the years is that this stuff t- kind of trickles down to the masses over time. So we should definitely expect that, you know, this will be coming to your the average Bitcoining mining rig, uh, Bitcoin uh, malware pretty soon. So, you know. So a couple of thoughts I had. The, the article has a really cute picture, which I thought was kind of kind of funny. Somebody at, it, at the marketing does. department did some did some fun art there. So you should check out the article just for that alone. But so we don't necessarily know how that original exploit happened that allowed them to drop the malware on there that that they used. Doesn't seem like we know that. Correct. They, they are um, they speculate in the article that it w- it got there through SS- an SSH 
uh, brute force, which is interesting because the firewall was not configured to allow SSH through. So, you know, that says, well, either, either that changed, you know, at some point the system was, uh, you know, SSH was exposed or there's some other system in the environment that, that the adversary is, is uh, reflecting off of. Mm. Or, or the, um, the web application that's running on the system has some vulnerability that allows, in, like maybe a file upload uh, vulnerability where, where that allowed them to, the, the adversary to, to, uh, to take control. But that, that was uh, something that they do not definitively know. Yeah. And they, they don't know. And, and they didn't talk about this at all in the article, but I was wondering, and we, we don't know because we don't have a copy of the, the code or, or examples of the, of the CNC code. But I wonder if a WAF would have spotted any of the CNC code as malformed or, or malicious content in the HTTPS stream. Uh, it'd be interesting if a WAF could, could help stop some of this sort of behavior. But I guess it depends on how inno- innocuous the CNC type communication looks and you know, where they're doing it, how they're doing it. But I know some WAS can get pretty sophisticated about saying, you know, certain certain sizes of certain packets need to be this, and, uh, you know, headers can only be so big. So I'd be curious what the CNC traffic looked like and if a, a good WAF could have spotted it. Based on the way they've, they've described the traffic, it seems very likely that this is something that could be detected and stopped by a WAF. You know, but but again, that's just pure pure speculation, but, you know, it, it, it is pretty clearly um, doing something to trigger the, um, you know, the, 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 the shim to route traffic to the Trojan. Now, having said that, I mean, there's the obvious arms race. You put in a, a WAF that blocks it, and, you know, then they'll make the traffic look less, uh, you know, less different than everything else. So, yeah, uh, it, it depends on if you're specifically being targeted, they're looking for targets of opportunity. If you're a target of opportunity, making your, their life more difficult means they'll move on. If you're specifically Correct. targeted, oof, that's yeah, tough. Yeah, and I, you know, I suspect, I, this is, again, also hypothesis, but most, I, I, have, I have this feeling that most of the time, advanced adversaries are not really after targets of opportunity. They're, they tend to be after specific targets. Now, having said that, they may use targets of opportunity to get to you know, specific targets, i.e. through you know, creating a watering hole attack or, or something like that. But um, Or joining a friend's podcast for five years to eventually work your way into his confidence to steal all of his money. Wow, that sounds pretty, uh, pretty serious. Uh, just hypothetically. Yeah, it's, that's a that's an interesting hypothesis right there. Yeah, uh-huh. we'll have to keep an eye on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you know this uh, this kind of goes back to the you know the point that we have to enhance our ability to detect anomalies. You know, not only at the edge of the network, but also on systems themselves. And it kind of points out quite likely if. If you were running a CrowdStrike or a Carbon Black or something like that, you, you very likely would be able to see this now. Obviously, again, there's it's an arms race, so can't can't say that it would uh, you know would always be be so. But it does point out that you you know as time goes on, we have to have the ability to have deeper insight into the happenings on on our systems because you know, we just we can't rely on looking at things from the outside and assuming that we're going to see something unusual that, that triggers our, um, you know, uh, triggers us to understand that something is going wrong. Yeah. Agreed. And you know, the cloud stuff is just making this even more complicated because it's a new, new domain with different operational parameters we're not used to. And yeah. once again, we've got to get our arms around that or it's going to get out ahead of us. Absolutely. All right. The next next story comes from ZDNet, and the title here is Ransomware Victims Thought Their Backups Were Safe. They Were Wrong. Dun, dun, dun. It was a really interesting, it's just kind of a, a slight diversion before we get into it, um, 
a, little, a pretty interesting separate article about how I think over the past several years there were seven or eight case, seven, seven or eight instances where different police departments across the U.S. had lost data uh, such that it impacted uh, ongoing criminal cases, which is just really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, you know, the old crime dramas of the bad guy getting off on a technicality when all the technicality could be that the evidence was lost due to ransomware. Right. Which, right. oh yeah. But you know, it does set up an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic. You know, if you think about what's going on with Soda Nokibi and Maze, where you know the 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 uh, ransomware purveyors are threatening to release the data. So now, you know, the police department in this case has an incentive to get the data back, but um, you know. It, but it's the criminals who have an incentive to keep the data private, right? So it seems like, you know, if you're the criminals, you would want to, you know, go and try to pay off those ransomware gangs so that they don't disclose the data that would then be used to incriminate you. Yeah, it, you could start up a whole side business of, hey, I've got access to this police department and I know right. you're being prosecuted. I can make that evidence disappear. Go away. Right. It's a whole it's a cottage industry in the making. It is. It is. And or or if you're a ransomware group, you could be like, hey, instead of Bitcoin, how about some of that captured meth? Wow. Or or uh, or seized guns or Sure. I mean, yeah, so many different opportunities there. But is it quite uh, you know, I, I would say most police departments, like most government organizations, are on tight budgets with limited resources, but the implication of them losing their data is really impactful. But I doubt that they're getting being given the budget or the expertise to defend it as we would probably like. And it's going to get more interesting, I think. Yeah, I, I completely agree with with, with that. Um, I'm waiting for after the 2020 census that, you know, five months later... Well, guys, we got to kind of do it again. See? <laughs> we forgot to back it up. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so the story here is that a lot of organizations appear to be getting the message about the importance of backups. However, sometimes the message is getting a little uh, skewed. So the the deal is... The UK National Cybersecurity Center uh, is up, has updated its guidance in response to some recent problems, which uh, encourages people not only to back up their data, but also to ensure that uh, their backups, or they have at least one backup that is offline, so that uh, if they have a ransomware attack at any given time, that you know there is a backup of the data that is safe from being overwritten and you know this is a problem because if when you think about it any uh, you know any any device that's connected to your system a system that's being uh, being encrypted including you know file sync and share services or or you know USB backup drives or what have you even you know remote file servers the the data on those are going to get encrypted now there are certain services like Dropbox and, and uh, uh, Microsoft OneDrive and some others that will, uh, will allow you to recover old versions, but only up to a point. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a limit on how far back you can go in terms of time. And then also, most of them have a certain number of versions that you can go back. Now... You know, like I think, uh, I, I believe it's Dropbox. Maybe it's uh, OneDrive. I wrote so many different things recently um, that will only let you go 25 versions back. Which is interesting because 25 versions, I, I guess they must be doing some sort of delta compression on that because of just storing the differences. Because they, if they were to store 25 discrete versions of every file you backed up, that would not be viable. That's too much space. So... They must be doing yeah. something fancy, which is fine. But, you know, they bring this up in the article, and you bring, you mentioned it too. A lot of people are like, hey, I've got cloud backup. I'm good to go. Well, here's the thing. Those cloud backups 
recognize when a file changes and backs it up and overwrites the old one. So by default, if you had your files encrypted, your cloud backup is now overwriting your unencrypted files with the encrypted version of those files. So it's really handy for hands-off backup, but now you go to, you know, your, your cloud backup's trying to have the latest version all the time and keep it handy and safe for you. Well, guess what? That latest version is the one that's fully encrypted and the previous version is gone, unless you do what you're talking about, which is somehow have revisioning that goes back far enough in time and, and, and in versions, or somehow have an offline. The problem that I think a lot of organizations are have is backups are really easy when they're automated and automatic and online. When you start talking about offline, that gets expensive uh, in terms of people and complexity of your infrastructure. But yeah, this is this is the problem. If, if your backups are connected to the machine that's got ransomware on it, a lot of these guys will now go look at uh, connected drives and map drives and USB sticks and whatever else is and external drives that are attached to that same box and have at it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, um, I, I've seen this go awry several times where uh, organizations have com- conflated you know, disaster recovery scenarios and just assumed that their hot site, you know, they have sand to sand replication in place. And, you know, this, that sand to sand replication will, will just happily replicate any kind of corruption from one side to the other. And now you, now you have a very expensive, uh, you know, mirrored set of corrupt data, which is, which is just amazing. Uh, so, you, you know, it really, really does warrant kind of thinking through um, what, how, how this needs to work for your organization. I do like in the, in, in the uh, NCSC's write-up, they make a reference to the 321 rule, which is a very easy thing to remember. It's, you know, three different devices, backups to three different devices. I'm sorry, three different copies and two different devices, one of which is off-site. Then the question is, at what velocity? Like, how often? You know, and this is the, the next challenge is, for an off-site, offline backup, how recent is that data if you've got to restore? Well, they, I mean, this, now you're starting to talk about, um, you know, RPOs, right? The traditional disaster recovery, recovery point objectives. How long can your business, you know, how much time can you afford to lose in your data? So, you know, at any given point in time, let's assume that you, you know, you've, you've lost a certain amount of data. Is, is one hour worth of data okay? Is two hours, eight hours? Because that's what's going to tell you how often you need to do those backups. And, you know, and, and they have, obviously, as you were pointing out, you know, pretty significant implications based on how, tight that RPO needs to be. Yeah, it becomes problematic. I mean, certainly having a week's week's old data is better than no data. Correct. Now, the one thing they don't talk about in here is the other side of of the whole RPO discussion, which is RTO. And we've we've seen in some instances where organizations, even though they had backups, they chose to pay the ransom anyway because the you know, it would just take too long for them to go in and recover data off of their backups and get everything back up and running, which is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. But, you know, I guess in certain circumstances, it, it might you know kind of make sense. But again, you when you're designing a, a solution to protect your data, you have to consider both of those those things you know just because you can recover the data doesn't necessarily mean you can recover it in a time that is useful to your business indeed so, it gets complicated bad guys suck <laughs> they definitely do absolutely uh, and then the, the last the last uh, thing I wanted to mention is that the, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission released a new uh, document this past week called Cybersecurity and Resiliency Observations. And this comes from the um, 
a, a particular group in the SEC called the OCIE. I think it's the Office of Compliance Inve- and Investigations Enforcement, or something like that. It's not. It doesn't sound like a group that I would want to, to piss off. To be honest, they are the overseers of uh, of brokerages and that sort of thing. So you know, stock trading platforms and. Um, Things I, I don't believe they have domain over public companies, um, at least this part of the SEC. Uh, so, so kind of with that in that context in mind, it the list they have here is pretty good. You know, what occurs to me is that it's yet another list. Well, you know, the more lists, the better, right? It's. It's yet another list with, you know, more high-level, fuzzy, platitude-level guidance. And, and the, it, it, I, I guess I'm just getting old and cranky, and, and, which is probably certainly true. Yes. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm getting impatient with, you know, the, 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 the industry is kind of on fire right now. I mean, we're... we're we have lots and lots of issues, and we have regulators like this releasing guidance, which is intended to be helpful. And I, and I think it's done in the vein of, well, you know, we have to do something to help. And so let's look across our, our constituents and find out what what seems to be working, and we'll put that into a guide, which is exactly what this is. But at the end of the day... There's really it, it's so high level, and in fact, they actually go on to say that there's no uh, there's no one size fits all solution to this. It, it it's almost um, it, I, I think we just get we get buried right. You can you can open up any given security website, security news website on any given day, and some either vendor regulator. You know, security thought leader, whatever, is crapping out some new framework of of controls that they believe will lead you to salvation, and uh, you know, and there's there's never any you know an, any significant guidance on how to actually do this, and I, I guess I'm just getting uh, I'm getting annoyed by that. Can you tell? I can, I can, and I think you're right. In many ways, I think that the industry rewards these attempts at guidance. So that's why it's going to keep happening. I think there's a lot of customers who are hungry for it. But I think back, you know, I try to equate to what we do maybe to a lawyer. And you probably don't see a lot of lawyers putting out this sort of thing. Because if you ask a lawyer any sort of straight up question, their typical answer is, well, it depends. I need more information and details about the specifics of the situation. And I think that's very true for InfoSec. Uh, There certainly are high-level platitudes that work, that apply to many situations, you know, two-factor authorization. But until you get into the weeds, it's really tough to have actionable advice for a specific organization or, or, or situation. You know, we can kind of do it a little bit on the show because we're taking a specific situation and trying to dissect it. But it's still very unique to each organization how they approach their infosec. Now, maybe that's bad. Maybe it shouldn't be that way. Maybe it should be more like engineering uh, or, or architecture or whatnot, where there are certain accepted standards and practices of the industry, and you know, you are you will build the building this way for these sorts of tolerances and loads, and that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, but we don't do that in InfoSec. In fact, we always seem to be reinventing the wheel and fail to learn from our own experiences and examples. And, uh, you know, we want to keep touching the fire ourselves over and over again. And we don't, we don't seem to pass along accepted best practices very well. Everybody wants to do it their own way. Yeah, I, I, I certainly, I, I certainly see a lot of that. I, I guess the the thing that concerns me, and may, maybe I'm doing a, a bad job of, um, of explaining myself. Not that you, I think you misunderstood. It's, it, it, 
I think that a lot of security happens on the margins when you are making risk trade-off decisions. You know, uh, all I, I, I suspect that you could go to any given security department. Now, I know that there's going to be exceptions, right? But the the types of guidance that are in here are pretty well known, right? There's there's nothing in here that you're going to read it and say, oh my gosh, this is just a great idea. If we did this, all of our problems would be solved. That, that's It's not that kind of guidance. It's, this, it's the same kind of you know, basic blocking and tackling stuff, which is, it's good stuff. Look, I, I am, I, I'm not, I don't mean to bash on the SEC because I think this is obviously a well thought out list of stuff. My, you know, my. Yeah, there's, there's nothing in here I disagree with. Exactly. Yeah. It is all good stuff. As most all of these lists are, it comes down to how they are implemented you if you read this and you know you have the best of intentions in, to implement this stuff you're never going to be able to do that it comes down to how you in well, your organization make trades up trade-offs well i'll pick on a couple of just examples at random that are very very well known patch management this is all they say about patch management establish a patch management program covering all software i.e. in-house developed, custom off-the-shelf, and other third-party software, and hardware, including antivirus and anti-malware installation. Okay. Um, There's a thousand different... I don't disagree. But there's a thousand different ways to go about that. Right. And nobody can do it all all the time. So what do you do instead? What what do you do when you can't do that? They're not wrong to say that, but... If it were that simple, we wouldn't still be struggling with it as an industry. Yeah, so so maybe that maybe that's that's where some of the focus has to come, you know, because I don't I, I see lots of these lists of, you know, here are the the core controls, but I don't ever almost ever see, you know, the the, the other side, you know, here is how to think about things when you can't do things the way they should be done. You know, here's how here's how to assess risk and you know here here are here's some guidelines on you know what is acceptable and what is not I mean obviously again that even that's difficult to do because so, there's so many different things. Are you saying kind of like if I go back to my two factor you've got an executive who's got a tablet and for whatever reason cannot or will not use two factor but needs to get access to certain data on the go so they can't use two-factor so how do you secure it instead exactly exactly that's exactly right yeah well you know what that's always going to be beyond the 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 basics that that's nuance that only comes from experience and hardcore you know down in the dirt training that isn't some vendor telling you their tool can solve all your problems well, that, I mean, that's true. I mean, these are these are operational issues that are that are that tend to be unique to specific organizations. But I but I still think that even so, there's 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 probably some commonalities. There's probably some rules of thumbs thumb that can be developed to to help organizations make better decisions. When it comes to security, and I, I mean, it's, I, I don't know what the, uh, you know, I know there's there's lots of, uh, you know, f- of fancy or um, in, in, in some pretty extensive uh, programs like Fair and, um, you know, and, and, and there's threat modeling, uh, you know, programs and and so on and so forth, but, you know, the the reality is, most of those are unapproachably complex. And, I'm, and it just occurs to me that kind of like, you know, these things here, I, I, I would, um, I would consider to be like heuristics. You know, we, we we have to have certain heuristics in place to, in order to protect our data. We have to, you know, you know, keep the bad guys out and let the good guys in, and and so on and so forth. Least privilege and all that stuff. But it seems like what we don't yet have are good heuristics 
on handling the edge cases and the and you know the things that don't work the way they should. All right, but to push back slightly, we can't even get the basics right. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, fair. That's so, fair. I, That's I fair. mean, I don't. But I, but why I, I, can't we get the basics right? And and I you know I think one of the reasons we can't get the basics right is because we make bad decisions. Well, sure. But I guess what I'm saying is that I've seen a lot of good be perfect be the or good be the enemy of perfect. Sure. Or perfect be the enemy of good enough. And yeah. edge case extremists, as I like to call them, getting hung up on low probability events ruining an 80 percentile solution yes and so i guess my only caveat or pushback on what you're saying is that you know if i can at least do past management in 80 percent of my environment that's better than doing none you know even though i know i've got gaps or i can't fix everything i, I can at least lower my footprint and lower my attack surface to a certain degree uh, by doing the basics to a certain degree but i think we also get caught up in not doing the basics well because vendors push new tools and educate the market and convince CISOs and CIOs to go buy the shiny new tool. And they, they want to do fun new things like, uh, you know, threat hunting and uh, attribution and that sort of, you know, and, and deception technology when we should be spending those resources and time on asset management and patching, in my opinion. But that's not sexy and that doesn't sell ferraris right so i think <laughs> no you're right and i think that there's a maturity level that some of those tools make a lot of sense for once you're mature enough but when we jump forward on that maturity timeline and start deploying this other stuff that is meant for a far more mature organization that's got the basics down fairly well i think we're working on the wrong thing and we're you know chopping down the wrong forest but we feel like we're making progress and I don't, you know, I could get off on a whole rant on that. And I know this is probably not necessarily what, what you want to talk about with this particular article. But I do feel that a lot of times organizations get very distracted by shinies. And they don't spend their resources where they need to. Or, or, you know, similarly, but slightly different, I often wonder when you get this guidance from government organizations, um, if you're a regulated entity of some variety that has the government coming in and auditing you, you know, I have seen, I, I, I fear that certain organizations, much like PCI, will play to PCI only, right? Study for the test. And they just got to pass their, their regulated exam and they're good. You know, sometimes it's got to go beyond that. And so, I don't know, it gets, it's just, man, this shit gets complicated. <sighs> <laughs> well... If, if it weren't complicated and, and it were easy, you know, none of us, none of us would have jobs. Yeah. Right. It it just um, and, and and by the way, you're you're you are correct. I I, I wasn't intending to say that, or propose that we should, um, you know, we should be thinking about well, how do we not, you know, how do we avoid the eighty percent solution and and ensure we get the hundred percent. That's my my point was. We should absolutely go off and do the eighty percent, but we should we should be thinking about you know how 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 should we think about that remaining twenty percent? Is it acceptable to leave it like that? You know, should should we go off and do something about it? You know, how how do we make that how do we make that decision? Is it is it more important for us to spend money to go fix that that remaining twenty percent that we're not patching? Or should we put that mon that the money that we would, you know, use to fix that in improving our uh, asset management system? Or, you know, that that's that's the I guess where I'm at is how do we think about the trade offs? Well, I would think I think there's a value diminishing returns as you to get close to 100 percent of coverage on something, right? And, yeah. and it gets yeah. much more expensive that last few percentile. Yeah. I think that that's where leadership and experience comes into play and good guidance from, you know, senior leadership who, who've been there, done that. And, you know, but also understand, hey, what is the risk trade-off for the organization? Can I accept this risk? Or 
you know, if I can cover my 80 percentile for ten thousand dollars, with the last twenty, you know, the, the next ten percent causes me another twenty thousand dollars, and the last ten percent causes me fifty thousand dollars. Where is the trade-off? And I think that's where we we struggle, right? We we have these hundred percentile solutions. Everything must be covered. Well, guess what? I can't cover everything. There's going to be things on my network that my scanner doesn't know how to look at. Right. And whether we like it or not, we're ignoring there that. There it is. There it is, yeah. Right, and we we don't accept reality. So, you know, when we tell the auditors or whoever, yeah, we scan on it, we, we've got good coverage for everything on the network. Well, do you? You know, well, then there's that mainframe we can't scan because it breaks it. And this other, this printer goes wonky, and, you know, and that, that camera over there goes cannywampus, so we can't scan that. You know, that's where it starts to get a little more nuanced. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So... I don't know. I, I I still am a believer that most organizations should be spending their energy working on the basics and making the basics as, as efficient and repeatable and automated as possible, and that will solve a lot of their problems. And trying to get too sophisticated too early without the right staff and without the right skill sets and without the right budget, I think, is a distraction, and it's a risk that a lot of CISOs run when they start, you know, getting going to the nice sales demos from the sales people who are out there just trying to help us. <laughs> by, by the way, I have, uh, I have run into numerous, numerous CISO type people whose perspective is that, you know, they can save a bunch of money on training their employees because there are plenty of vendors willing to provide that training for free. I cannot tell you how incredibly dangerous and terrible that is. I'm with you. I'm with you. I was there, man. I was on the inside. <laughs> I used to do that. Believe me. Yeah, I, so, so I guess the the kind of just to just to maybe bring it to a close. The thing that that concerns me, or the thing that I've, I'm thinking about, is you. You know, you a couple of minutes ago said something that I think really hit the nail on the head. That it takes seasoned leadership. To who's been there and done that to make some of these decisions, and I guess my you know my point is, you know how do we how do we characterize that is you know because not you know no two people have the same set of experiences, and and so there there's got to be some um, you know there's got to be something there that we can we can describe so that people can. You know, maybe make better decisions in that are more in line with those people who have uh, ha- have lots of experience, because those 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 people are are basing their decisions on you know on certain principles that they've just kind of collected in their minds. And and my point is, how do we how do we render those explicit so that? You know, other people can get the benefit of them. That, that's where I'm. Well, you're, you're kind of you're kind of arguing for this thing that we've kicked around for the last twenty years, which is should security engineering be a true engineering discipline that is taught as an engineering discipline, and everything that goes along with being a true engineer, which we throw around in the infosec and, and IT community, but it's not the same as an, a mechanical engineer or electrical engineer or you know whatever. Yeah, I may, maybe so, maybe so, and maybe you know, maybe I'm thinking maybe even less like that and more like skilled trades. You know the the yeah. You know the the journeyman apprentice sure. master a master cyberman. But it comes down to these person. these are the accepted ways of doing things in our industry. Yes, there's only a couple ways to run plumbing, right? Correct. And this is the code. This is what it says. The downside to that is limited innovation. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I don't know. It's it's there's a plus and minus there, and uh, you know maybe we'll. Yeah. I, well, so I do think there's a there's a there's a risk of limited innovation, but I still think that if those things are, you know, th- th- there's some timeless principles that I think we are, as we move forward, we're losing. Um, things like what does least privilege mean, right? And you know, and 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 other things which you know 
are uh, they're they they they're not dependent on any particular technology. They were appropriate when we we're talking about mainframes back in the '60s and '70s, and about PC networks in the '90s and 2000s, and in the cloud today. And I just I, I, it it occurs to me that we're not, um, you know, we're not really training people to deeply understand some kind of some core principles that would help, um, you know, help make better decisions. That's, I guess, where I'm, where I'm at. Yeah, so. I hear you. So anyway, I I think I killed this several times over so <laughs> anyhow <laughs> flogging the deceased equine are you yes yes so that's uh that's really all the stories that we have for this evening i uh, I, I do want to say thank you everyone for listening thank you to our patreon donors I, you, you are uh, you're very helpful uh, you know this server this uh, service is not not free to us so we we do invest a lot of time and you know personal time and money into the you know, the, the operation of this. So that, that helps. Thank you very much. Yeah, honestly, you guys are awesome. And it, it, I'm always humbled when I see how many of you have chosen to donate. And thank you. And if you'd like to donate, if you'd like to be a new Patreon donor, we're always accepting new ones. That's right. Absolutely. Otherwise, we're going to have to get evil ads and talk to you about, you know, pillows and, <laughs> and uh, underwear. We'll be, re- we'll be reviewing uh, random Amazon toiletries or whatever. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the other popular podcast ads right now that are out there. Well, uh, Audible, that, you know, Audible is the, like the, the, the perennial thing that everybody talks about. All oh, right. Look at here. We're giving them free ads. Okay. The, the audio book service from that big online book retailer that sells everything but books these days. How about that? <laughs> oh, you mean so, Barnes and Nobles. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, uh, uh, thanks for listening. Have a great week. We'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care.